Are you gonna wear that thing the whole time? Maybe. Hey everybody, welcome to Britain Tiff's Double Feature. Where we watch a horror movie, watch its remake, and then we fucking talk about it. So let's fucking talk about it. Warning, spoilers ahead. With it being February, we thought, what better movie to start with than My Bloody Valentine and... My Bloody Valentine 3D! 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 <laughs> so, My Bloody Valentine is a Canadian horror movie that came out in 1981. Taking place in the fictional uh, town of Valentine Bluffs, which was actually filmed in Nova Scotia, this movie is Canadian. In case you couldn't tell by the- I'm sorry. I'm so damn sorry. It took me until that point to realize it was Canadian. We both stopped, did a double take, looked at each other, and then went, what? It, 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 it's Canadian! Yeah, it's Canadian! This is a Canadian slasher. I like it. This movie released in February, and it stars Neil Affleck, Laurie Hallier, and Paul Kelman with our love triangle, because it's Valentine's Day. After we open with uh, some very scantily clad miners getting uh, killed off right away, we open on a town that we come to find out is having a Valentine's Day dance for the first time in 20 years. So about 20 years prior, we had an awful tragic accident on Valentine's Day. While the whole town is in the midst of their Valentine's Day dance, we have six people down in the town's minds, two of whom are supervisors who decide to skedaddle and get out of there to go to the dance without checking the methane lines. Unfortunately, because of this, there is a huge explosion which makes six people completely trapped inside the mine, and it takes almost six weeks to get them out. Come to find out, there is one survivor. Harry Warden. Because he not only killed everybody else, but decided to also eat them to stay alive as long as he could, leading him to become crazy and be institutionalized. So the next year, when the Valentine's Day dance comes back, Harry Warden breaks out and attacks the two managers who left the mine, removing their hearts and leaving them in candy boxes at the dance. And since then, they haven't had a Valentine's Day dance. As Harry Warden always threatened to come back every year if they threatened to hold a Valentine's Day dance. But, you know, it's been 20 years. Who cares about that anymore? So this right. year they decide we're gonna have a dance. Right. When we come into town, everyone's excited. The young adults are excited, even Miss Mabel. Oh, Miss Mabel. Well, there's a Valentine's left for the mayor, and as he and the sheriff are leaving, he decides to open it, and he finds a human heart. Which kicks off of, instead of just calling somebody, he just decides to hold it on his lap and go, why, why, why? <laughs> like okay. anybody would. Wasn't it like, not again or something Oh yeah, it was like, like not again. Not again. Not again. Instead of just going, oh God. Right, so later that night, we see your classic POV slasher shot outside of the laundromat, where poor Miss Mabel is just making some more Valentine's decorations. She finds a beautiful heart box for her. She opens it excited. Maybe it's from the sheriff. Who knows, they've been doing kind of googly eyes at each other. And come to find out, it is a Valentine telling her that she's about to die. Die she does in gruesome fashion. Um, she ends up getting hauled into one of her own dryers, one of the industrial ones. Which I have to say is a pretty cool effect when it opens. It's like, crispy, crispy. <laughs> it's that meme of, of uh, uh, Two-Face from the Dark Knight and it's just oh. him turning and it's like, when you open the oven door and <laughs> it just hits you in the face and you're like, crispy. <laughs> yes, yes I've seen that. That was one of the shots though that was kind of cut by the MPAA. It was, so there was a, I wanna say nine minutes. Yeah, nine, nine minutes that yeah. were completely cut due to graphics. Graphics? Graphic nature. Due to graphic nature. Uh, we saw the original without it at first, and then we went back and watched the footage again. And to this day, it honestly holds up. I do see why some of it was cut, because it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Um, but I I like watching it to know what ended up happening. Yeah. I. I I liked it. I would have loved the addition to it because I I do like a little bit of gore in my movies, but honestly, this one, 
I don't think it hurt too bad for the cut. Also, another thing worth noting, as long as we're ta kind of talking about kills, Miss Mabel kind of hurt. It did. She was just a sweet old lady who just wanted to have a happy Valentine's Day dance, and you took that away from her. You took her life away from her before she saw another Valentine's Day dance. Damn you, Harry Warden. Damn you, Harry Warden. Damn you. But really, that's the thing about the characters in this movie is you actually really feel for them. They're not just cannon fodder, which- <laughs> I went in expecting, I had never known anything about this movie before, and I went in totally expecting to not like it and just kind of watching it just because, but I did end up feeling for a lot of the characters. There is good and human interaction. Let's talk about the love triangle between oh. Sarah, Axel, and TJ. So everybody's kind of in the wrong, but everybody's feelings are also valid. Yeah, very so, understandable. TJ ended up just fucking off and going off to the West Coast doing whatever he wanted to do without telling anybody mm -hmm. and just completely left his girlfriend with no word. And now he comes back and is expecting everything to just go back to normal. It's not, it's not gonna happen, dude. Yeah. While he was gone, Sarah got together with Axel, which was understandable because if your boyfriend ups and leaves you with no word about how he's doing, what are you gonna do? So when TJ comes back to town and everyone's uncomfortable, it's really believable and you feel for everyone because everyone's in a tight spot. So you understand Sarah does want to get back together with TJ. You understand how Axel is feeling insecure about that. However, he's being a dick about it. Everyone's being a dick about it. He's very like possessive, he's very <laughs> handsy, and he's not listening to Sarah when she tells him to back off. And that makes me, he's, he's being a dick. Both of the boys end up being dicks there, quite a few times. There is just like this measuring contest happening between them and it's like they don't ever let Sarah just talk mm -hmm. about what she wants. Instead, they just push. And one of the other things that I really liked is uh, Sarah's relationship with Patty. They do feel oh. like really good best friends. Uh, so sweet. They're talking about how she's gonna juggle these two guys and she basically just tells Patty that they're both being idiots and she doesn't know what to feel, which is very, very real. Very real. So, it's not just that I'm unconditionally in love with both of them. No, yeah. they're both being jerks, but I don't know which one's being less of a jerk. Exactly. You can't have them both, you know. I don't want them both. No, no. With the discovery of Mabel's body, as you can tell, things are now canceled and they're not gonna have anything else to do with Valentine's Day as they are too afraid of Harry Warden's return. Uh, so with the dance canceled, uh, TJ offers to host the party at his father's mine, which is basically their break room on top side. Because you don't want to have it in a very public place, but let's have it in our work break room. Right. We have everything we need there, which is actually exactly what TJ says. Yeah, come on, now. we got everything we need down there. We got, uh, let's see, we got a, a rec room, we got a pool table, everything. That is exactly what TJ says. <laughs> While deciding this at the bar, the bartender, whose name happens to be Happy, which means he is not a happy character. Right. He's, he's, he's a grumpy old fuck. Right. Understandably, Happy is not happy about what the kids have planned. So he was around when Harry Warden was doing his first original killing spree. It is it a killing spree if it's two people? Is, is it just a double homicide? I think it's just a double homicide. Let's, let's take that back. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Happy was around when Harry Warden was doing his first double homicide and must have been completely scarred because he keeps warning those kids that don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And he gets mad. Uh, like, understandably so about it. Uh, kids always blow him off. Yeah, they're being kind of flippant about it. Uh, to be honest, probably most of them were probably like six or seven. Yeah, so they were kids. They didn't really think about it. But yeah. Happy is saying, how dare you do this? You're going to bring bad things upon us and it's gonna be your fault and I'm gonna do something about it. Assholes. So Happy goes down to the mine and decides he's gonna play a prank and he sets up, it's pretty elaborate honestly, this this fake Harry Warden to like raise a pickaxe when the door opens and he's so proud of his handiwork. He goes back once, <laughs> twice, <laughs> three times, <laughs> and the fourth time, it's not so funny anymore. See, that's when you just overdid your joke. I don't know if it's because he's drunk or because he just thinks he's honestly that funny, but the fourth time is where it turns out it is no longer the dummy and it is Harry Warden giving him a nice um, uppercut directly to the jaw. Uh, this is the one that I do wish that had the footage that was cut remaining mm. in because it is very, very gnarly. It goes up through the jaw, through his eye, mm. and 
Um, I'll I'll talk about it later when we get to the remake bit, but I, I do really like that shot and I feel like the practical effect really held up. Oh yeah, absolutely. But like even, even in the first version that you and I saw that had that particular detail kind of cut out, we could see it kind of came up somewhere. I didn't know if it was in his rib or if it was in under his jaw, but he was being dragged away. Oh! So my favorite part of that kill is not just the kill, but it's him being dragged away through the gravel mm. and like the weight of him. It's just, it's gnarly and it's great. It's gross in all of the best ways. Mm -hmm. At this point, Happy's body disappears from view and our crew shows up for their party. And let's talk about our crew for a minute. We have a really interesting group of young adults here, not teenagers, not older adults. We gotta have the older adult bit covered with the sheriff and the mayor. Um, but with this group of young adults, you've got your comic relief who is Howard, right? Uh, yes, but he's not very good comic relief. He's not very funny. Most comic relief isn't actually comic relief. I don't know how uh, snorting Coca-Cola up your nose proves as entertainment, but go for it, Howard. Keep doing your dreams. I guess there's not a lot else to do in Valentine Bluffs. So once we're at the mine, you have your normal party shenanigans, and you have your standard love triangle blow up, which separates a lot of parties involved. Uh, throughout this whole movie too, we're getting a lot of red herrings, including TJ and Axel. So this is another pivotal moment just to see them kind of split off, because there's more murdering to do. Our first murder at the party itself is with Dave. Dave goes into the kitchen to get himself a hot dog because, you know, parties need hot dogs for some reason. Boiled hot dogs. Boiled, boiled hot dogs. Not even grilled. Not even grilled. Boiled hot dogs. And he gets his face shoved into the boiling pot of water and boiled along with the hot dogs. His body is then unknowingly stuffed into the fridge that we will find later. So next up we have what our lovers in the shower room, right? John and Sylvia. John and Sylvia in the shower room making out on a bench. And this is another one of those moments where they could easily have just been cannon fodder. But, you know, you really feel for them and you're kind of scared for them. And well, when they're ready to get down to business, uh, Sylvia says she needs something to get things going. And to his credit, he had a rubber ready to go. He was very safe about it and all prepared. Right. Good job, man. But what she really wanted was a beer. So like a gentleman, he goes off and gets it for her. And unfortunately, that's when we lose poor Sylvia. Then freaked out by having all of the showers turned on, which I would be too, that's a huge waste of water. That bill. She has all the minor clothing falling on top of her, completely discombobulating her to the point where then Harry Warden shows up and grabs her and in the most gnarly kill I think of the entire movie, stabs her onto a shower head. And it comes out her mouth, doesn't it? Oh yes, it comes out her mouth and the water continues to flow through out of her mouth. Now this is one that I do kind of agree with the MPAA on. I think it's almost better to not show it. Mm -hmm. At one point when John comes in and finds her, you see like a side view kind of of her mouth and you see the water coming out. However, I feel like it makes it more terrifying to not see what it actually looks like. So you have to kind of imagine it. Yeah, exactly. This is one of those situations where we're not agreeing because of content. We're agreeing for storytelling purposes because like they say, nothing is scarier than what you can imagine, so. The effect was good. Like yeah. when we saw what it looked like, the effect was good. I just think that it did a, it did a disservice to not kind of make your mind think about what it looked like and because that ends up being more terrifying. Exactly, and framed against his reaction to it, which was like stunned horror and, and then you could see the silhouette of her face, like it really worked well for me in that in that respect, so I liked it. While this is all going on, Patty decides that she wants to cheer up Sarah from that lovely man fight earlier by going down to the mines and tries to convince Hollis and another couple to go along with them. And once we get down into the mines, Hollis, your lovely conductor. I love Hollis. Hollis. <laughs> There's just gonna be like a heart of Hollis's face in between right. us. So Hollis takes them down and, you know, amongst all the warnings, Hollis is one of the responsible ones in the group. And uh, two, two of our friends here, a couple, pair off to do some fooling around. So you can imagine how that turns out. What is with people fooling around in mines? It's dirty. It's gross. You're going to get things places. Stop doing it. It's not, it's not a good idea. 
while we have our crew down in the mines, people start realizing what's going on topside. Uh, our group is coming together, everyone's freaking out, and we get my favorite line in the whole movie delivered by Axel, which is... Harry Wharton's back! Everyone get the fuck out of here! So everyone hauls ass back to town, and uh, our boys, TJ and Axel, decide they gotta go down and get their friends, because Harry must be down there. He's coming for us. Mm -hmm. I have to say, too, going back a little bit, at one point, when Dave is dead, his heart has been put into the boiling pot of hot dogs, and the girls pick it out with the tongs, and they're like, ew, what is that? As somebody who grew up in rural northern Wisconsin, have you never been deer hunting or around people who have been deer hunting? Because do you not know what a heart looks like? I can understand people not knowing what a human heart looks like. That's a stretch. You should know what a human heart looks like. <laughs> but how have you not seen a like a deer heart at least? Like haven't you seen a cooked deer heart? Like you should, it's, it's a fucking, it's a fucking heart. It's a fucking heart. It's a fucking heart. Sorry. You okay? Uh, I don't want to talk about my childhood. Anyway. <laughs> TJ and Axel end up taking the elevator down to find everyone, and you know, once we're like, okay, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. Oh, we have to go find our friends, which were something in Harriet. They're red shirts. Not Mike and Harriet. Mike and Harriet. Mike and Harriet. Mike and Harriet. They both got drilled to death and not the way they hoped. It was a massive drill through their backs. Now we didn't get to see this happen. No, it just is there. It's just there. And we see it when Hollis, again, Hollis, goes off to find the friends and leaves our resident coward, Howard, with the girls. A. Yeah. Uh, and Howard has, meanwhile, run off because they saw our minor killer come down, come down the shaft. He's like, oh, let's go, let's go. To kind of condense what ends up happening, there's a lot of this person goes off, they die, this person goes off, they die. Mm -hmm. Eventually it comes down to just being Patty, Sarah, Axel, and TJ trying to get out of the mine to a point where they try to go up an elevator, the elevator doesn't work. They try to go up a ladder, the ladder doesn't work. So it's finally we gotta go to the train cars. And along that route, the Axel falls in water. To go back to the red herring thing a bit, this is kind of where like, oh, it's okay, so. It's not who we think it is, maybe. Going into this movie, like I said, I really did not know anything about it, but I knew it was not going to be actually Harry Warden. It was either going to be TJ or Axel. And this movie did a great job of holding suspense where I was kind of flip-flopping back and forth the whole time, but this is kind of the moment where it's cemented, it, 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 it's Axel. Right. Mm. So uh, we get to our trolley cars, um, our carts, whatever they're called, and- Patty gets it in the stomach! Patty gets it in the stomach, and she just goes to be with her sweet Hollis. Hollis. So, TJ has this final showdown with Harry Warden. He's trying to protect Sarah. Everyone's trying to get into the mine. They finally get everybody here. They're running down, and it's the big reveal where, in the scuffle, Mass comes off, and who is it? Axel. It's Axel, and why did Axel do it? Well, we get a nice little flashback uh, when his mask comes off. Axel was hiding under the bed when Harry Warden killed his father, who was one of the managers at the mine. So in this way, we kind of find out that Harry Warden is a lot like Jason Voorhees in the later Friday movies. I can't remember which one, I can't be bothered to. So in our scuffle, we've had a cave in, um, Axel cuts his arm off and he escapes into the mines, giggling and asking Sarah to be his bloody valentine. And that's where our original My Bloody Valentine ends. Not necessarily, because there is a bomb ass song over the credits called The Ballad of Harry Warden. And this movie did not have to go as hard in the credits song as they did. But they did. They did it for us. That song slapped. And it slapped hard. So. Overall, this, this movie pleasantly surprised me. I went in completely not expecting to have any real expectations, just watching it just because, but I felt for characters. I was guessing who the person behind it was, the effects held up, and I would definitely watch it again. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't sure what to expect. I mean, I've heard a little bit about both of the movies that we watched for this, and I definitely felt like we started off on the right foot with this movie. I enjoyed it. I would add it to my personal collection. 
the relationships felt good, the kills were pretty good overall, and yeah, I enjoyed it. Solid. A uh, highlight for me was definitely the character of Hollis because he was an absolute joy. He had a bomb ass mustache. He was a good boyfriend. He was a good person. He was best friend to like multiple people. He was responsible and he wasn't just like a comedic relief best friend. Like he was a legitimately kind person who I cared about and was actually really upset when he got taken out. <laughs> Hollis. So highlights for me, yeah, definitely Hollis. I loved Hollis. The character building in this movie was really great. Now it's not perfect, but I was really engaged with the storyline and I really felt fear for some of the characters when they were in danger. Um, also some of the concepts of the kills were really gross in the best way. Like we talked about the pickaxe and the shower scene. Um, enjoyable without being kind of too over the top in my opinion. There was a good variety of kills. They weren't just the same kill over and over again. I think every character died in a different way. Mind you, it was still the pickaxe, but yeah. it was done in a different way. Right. So let's talk about low lights for a minute. Um, I had one that was kind of both, kind of low light and highlight, and it was kind of earlier in the beginning when we got the first heart in a box. And they, we took it to the coroner's office, someone in the medical field. <laughs> I know exactly what she's going with. <laughs> As someone in the medical field and probably figure out, is it a real heart? It is, is it a human heart? Like what's going on here? And let's just call him the coroner for simplicity's sake. He has it in a, in a metal dish and he has a glove on and he comes out having seemingly identified it. And he's like, oh yeah, it's a female heart, 30 years old. And first of all, that's incredibly specific. You can't tell that from a heart. You can't, you can't tell that from a heart. I don't, like, I don't know anything about the medical field. That's more your thing. But the thing that got me was he's apparently done his examination, right? He continues to pick it up and go, mm, mm hmm, yep, definitely 30 year old female. Like he's groping it. It feels uncomfortable. It feels weird. So in a way it's like, that's really weird, but also really funny. So it's kind of in both for me. This could also, like, I could just be really <laughs> wrong and things have changed since the last time I studied this, but like human hearts are only supposed to be the size of your fist. And that's a massive heart. Like it's big enough for him to like hold with two hands. If that's a 30 year old woman's heart, go to the doctor. I'm a 30 year old woman. I think my heart's that big. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm gonna cry. Anyway. Do you have any low lights? I do have one low light, but I don't know if it's technically a low light in the way you're thinking. My low light is because at the party, TJ is wearing this denim shirt. It's, <laughs> it's this whole denim getup. Denim shirt, denim pants, and he's got like that nice little tight ascot. And as the party goes on, he just keeps losing more buttons. And that gets lower and lower and lower <laughs> and lower. And I just find it hilarious. And then he goes down into the mines and doesn't even bother to close it up. Like, let's just... <laughs> We're gonna save people like this. Ugh, we gonna have the eye candy. Mm -hmm. Overall, best kill. Ooh, <sighs> this is hard because I love the concept of the shower kill, but the way the the way Happy's death, like maybe feel. I, I'm gonna gonna go with Happy's because of that drag. I think it depends on which version. If we're talking about the original version that had everything cut out, I'm gonna go with the shower scene because of just how gruesome that was. But if we're talking about where all the footage was added back in, I'm gonna also go with Happy because that was a very, very gnarly kill. And with that, let's get to the remake. So that brings us to 2009's My Bloody Valentine 3D. 3D. 3D! 3D! In case you didn't know, they made it in 3D. Right. That was such an asset to the movie, Tiffany. It was great. Uh, so when we rented this movie, we got the DVD version of it, and they gave us the 3D version of the movie, and we were originally very excited to watch it in 3D. Oh yeah. Old school 3D, until we started watching it in old school 3D. Mm -hmm. And the glasses didn't quite work, and we had to watch this. The whole time. It's great. As you can probably tell, this one's gonna be pretty fast because it was pretty generic and don't have much to say about it. Just to give you context, I was taking notes on my phone the whole time for both of them. Uh, for the first movie I had like three or four pages worth of notes of impressions and things of that nature. 
Uh, I had less than one page of notes for the second one, and one of them was a quote from Tiffany asking how much longer is on this movie. And I think we were only halfway through. The remake of My Bloody Valentine 3D takes place in 2009, where this setting has been changed from Valentine Bluffs, Canada to the town of Harmony, Pennsylvania. The credits roll with newspaper clippings and articles giving us the original backstory of this story, which I'm gonna tell you there's three different stories. It's all very convoluted and complicated and not for the better, honestly. So the first part of the story is that the owner's owner of the mine, his son, Dean. Tom. Anyway, he forgot to check the lines properly, screwed up on his job, which caused a methane explosion causing a huge cave-in. In this case, six miners were in the cave-in, including Harry Warden. Harry Warden. In this story, he ends up murdering the other miners and is the only survivor just because he murdered them for extra air. Kind of a dick move. Very dick move. So after this, he, he ends up in a coma. And a year later, he wakes up and after a very gruesome hospital slaughter, he decides to go to the mine, and do some young people killing, you know, like you do. In which case we get to the second part of the story where it's Harry waking up a year later and just coming to the mines and killing all these teenagers and only four of them happen to make it out, which are Sarah, Axel, the, uh, the, the girlfriend that I honestly can't remember her name at this point, and Dean, Tom. Anyway, so Harry ends up cornering uh, Tom in the the mine and gets shot by the sheriff, who is played by Tom Atkins, who can save Tom, but apparently can't save the movie. He does his best. But yeah, Harry runs off and uh, Leave, dies? Leaves? Leaves a very traumatized man yes. in its wake. And that ends the second part of the story. And we're not even like a full 20 minutes in yet. So now we get to the third part of the story. And this is where it really takes a turn from the original Mick. So now it's 10 years later and we have Tom coming back and just kind of like TJ did in the original movie, but now we have Sarah and Axel are married. And, and they can have a kid. They have a kid together who's walking and talking. So it's not even like a fresh kid. So when Tom just shows back up, Sarah is like she's seen a ghost it, again like in the original no one knows where he's been what he's been doing um, and they kind of have a moment where they talk and he disappears uh, but we also find out that Axel's been sleeping with Sarah's employee and has knocked her up in this case very there's there's no there's no really Valentine's Day and there's no mine. The right. only mention of Valentine's is that the original thing happened on Valentine's Day and he woke up a year later on Valentine's Day. And for some reason, there's hearts and chocolate boxes, but it really has nothing to do with anything about Valentine's Day. It's never really mentioned. Nobody ever talks about it, so I don't understand. And then the other thing is that Pretty much everybody's profession has changed and nobody works in the mine anymore. We're in the mine for maybe three scenes in this whole entire movie. And it, it's my bloody Valentine, it's a miner. Why are we not in a mine? Anyway, at this point, Axel has been changed to being the sheriff. Uh, Dean is- Tom. He, he's I, he's Dean Winchester. No, he's a different character. He's playing Tom. Okay, I love Jensen Ackles. I don't blame him for this, but it's Dean Winchester. They are literally wearing the same jacket. I'm, okay, we're gonna do this. So I have pictures saved, and you are gonna have to guess if it is taking place in My Bloody Valentine or Supernatural. Okay, okay. Picture number one. My Bloody Valentine? It is My Bloody Valentine. Good job. I'm proud of you. Supernatural? That is my bloody Valentine. Ah! <laughs> Next picture. Um. Is this Supernatural? It is Supernatural. Ah! <laughs> Next picture. My bloody Valentine? Supernatural! Oh, I rest my case. Fine. Call they Dean. they are the same character. They wear the same jacket. It's the same outfit. It's D it's Dean it's Dean Winchester. You, you're right. You're right. I'll let you have it. Moving okay. on from this. Okay, but let's let's talk about those characters. The love triangle in this one. Remember how we said it was intriguing. They felt real. It was hard to really you know root for one side or the other. Everybody sucks in this movie. Everyone sucks. Nobody has like any redeeming qualities. 
Uh, you got uh, Dean Tom, who just disappeared for 10 years and didn't say a word and just shows back up. Axel is cheating on his wife, um, is very possessive of her when Tom shows back up, which and he's just a jerk and then he's mad at his wife for like still having feelings for somebody else when he's cheating on her and it just it's 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 not good it's not a, it's not a good look for you axel oh speaking of not good look you want to talk about the first kill in our like present day timeline of the movie at the hotel oh so when tom dean when tom tom when tom gets to the town he stays in a hotel which turns into this big gratuitous like nudity scene where the couple next door is having sex and it's one of the teenagers from the beginning of the movie. She found out she was filmed against her will, goes out and just uh, doesn't even bother to put on any clothes, just grabs a gun and goes and threatens the guy. And then our murders start with uh, the man getting an ax to the top of the head and then she is chased around for an additional five minutes with no clothes on and eventually hides under a bed and gets a pickaxe to the stomach. Yeah, full frontal. It's it's not a 2000s remake or a slasher movie for that matter if there's not a gratuitous sex scene and exploitative nudity. And, and I hate it. I've heard two different stories. I've heard one where it was the screenwriter who wrote this and it was the screenwriter who played the guy who had sex with her. But I've also heard stories where it was the actress's own idea. She thought it was great for the character. I'm not gonna bump her for that, but just it was it was not my thing. It took me out of the movie and I thought like it was really unnecessary. Right. And not not for it. But we have that kill over and what does Axel do as the sheriff but immediately suspect um, Tom because that's what he's gonna do and it's frustrating because it's like yeah I can see how you got there but I also kind of hate it because you're doing it to be an asshole. I don't root for anyone. This one plays more like a police procedural than it does anything else. There's no Valentine's Day dance that's looming. It's it's a revenge slasher. So the only people who really need to be worried are the people who are connected with with the mine. So we finally eventually get to a mine where uh -huh. uh, Tom decides he needs to yes. go talk to somebody about possibly keeping it open. So he goes to visit the mine. While he's down there, the Harry shows up and locks him in a cage. And they have this stare down while he murders another guy and then disappears. And all these guys show up like, what did you do? And he's like, I didn't do it. I was in this cage. Mm -hmm. I really, really didn't do it. You ever have that moment where someone's trying a little too hard to make you believe something? That was this movie. Yeah, it, it, we had some nice red herrings in the original where at one moment you were sure it was this guy and then the next moment you're like, oh no, now I'm sure it's this person. We didn't get any of that here. We just got an asshole in the movie trying to tell us, no, it can't be this guy. You like this guy. You want to root for this guy without giving us much to make us root for him. Like, I'm, I'm not against like a bait and switch kind of ending, but... I didn't feel anything. I'll get into this more in the end, yeah. and I appreciate it when movies try to do something different for the remake to keep everybody who liked the original mm -hmm. guessing, but this one was just trying way too hard to be like, nope, can't be him. <laughs> so at this point, he's going, Tom is going around saying, Harry's back, Harry's back, Harry's back, and Axel just magically shows up behind a curtain. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> And he's like, it can't be Harry, <laughs> Harry's dead. That was really funny. We had this nice relationship drama like in the hospital when when Jensen Ackles is getting his arm like sewn up. So of course he's got like um, like a tank top on, you know, forget that eye candy bit in there. And uh, Sarah's there checking on him and then they're talking and this curtain just whips open and it's Axel going, Harry's dead. <laughs> Where the hell did you come from? <laughs> like, can you knock? <laughs> and they go to find Harry's body and it's been dug up and everyone's like, oh God, the ghost is back. <laughs> Apparently he was dead due to an act of vigilante justice years ago. The vigilante who killed him was terrified his ghost was gonna come back and guess what? The ghost comes back and once again, we get another thing through the eye. I get that this is a 3D movie, but they need to stop with the eyes. It just doesn't, it didn't, it doesn't sell well. It feels like 3D when it's done well, is fun and it's immersive. This is, it didn't feel like it. Like, you ever see those old 3D movies from the 80s? Like, I know one of the 
Friday the 13th movies was done in 3D. And there were some gimmicks that you could tell were just done for the sake of 3D. This whole movie is a 3D gimmick. Yeah. Almost 90% of the, the kills are things flying at you or something going through somebody's eye mm -hmm. because then it can come towards the screen. And it just, it, it, it really took me out of it. So he gets a pickaxe and through the eye and then it switches over to Axel and Sarah's house and then the, the housekeeper gets off while the kid is watching movies and this is where we get like a really good I shouldn't say really good this is where we get a homage to the original where the housekeeper is found in the dryer but it doesn't work because yeah. when Mabel was killed in the original she was in a laundry mat she had been in that dryer for quite a while this one was just she got killed at home and stuffed in the dryer and now she's burned to a curse within like three minutes yeah it just didn't work for me the other the other kill in the scene that was kind of fun was the sheriff was tom atkins tom atkins death is the one thing that i feel like was actually good in this movie yeah where uh that's one where if the 3d had worked for us it would have been great it would have been great mm -hmm. and it was gnarly it was through the jaw it was very reminiscent of happy but it was much gnarlier there was no eye thing so i was happy about that mm -hmm. so we have the supermarket where sarah and maggie megan and megan God. Megan. That doesn't see how much I care about her. Sarah and Megan are closing up and Megan's doing her thing where like, maybe your husband doesn't love you anymore. Da, da, da. And there's no time to think about it because the lights go off. We're being chased by our uh, Harry Warden. And we have a tense scene. They're in the, they're in the office. They're trying to get out the window. You send Megan out the window first. And they're like, wait, he's not there anymore. Surprise, motherfucker. Harry's on the other side. Pulls her out. Have no idea how he got around that fast. But uh, he pulls her out, and then Sarah gets out, she goes to the front, she finds Axel. They go around the building, and they find Deb with her heart out. And the words scribbled above her in blood are the same words she left in her valentine to Axel. It said, be mine forever. I'm just going to try to condense this as much as possible, because it is just a mash of what ends up happening. Tom gets a hold of Sarah. They go in the car to go show him a love her Axel's love nest. Axel is on the phone with her saying, no, Tom was in a mental institution. She can't decide who she wants to trust. She crashes the car to get away, decides to trust Axel, finds out he's cheating on her, then trusts Tom, then they're in the mines. Now there's a big triangle between them and they're like, she gets a hold of a gun and she's holding them both at gunpoint. And they're like, I didn't do it, shoot him. I didn't do it, shoot him. At this point, Axel just says what everyone in the audience is thinking. Just shoot both of us. Because that's going to solve everything. At this point, this is where we come to the big revelation that Tom was behind it all along by getting a non-existent Harry Warden to walk up to him and look him in the eyes and slowly dissolve away. <gasps> Tom did it? I'm so surprised. I had no idea. In which case, then Tom turns into Harry Warden and tries to attack them both. It's kind of unclear. Like, I feel like they're trying to say he has a split personality. But yeah, it seems like whatever part of Harry that's part of him is taken over now. And he tries to kill them both. And they get into this scuffle, which Sarah, who still has the gun, does not shoot for a long time. And Axel ends up getting it to the gun. Eventually she ends up shooting at him and hits the gas cans behind him and everything blows up. But yet he's not burned and not overly hurt. They send in a whole bunch of a team to get everybody out of there and they find Tom and they're like, don't worry, dude, we're gonna get you out of here. And what is that? Another pickaxe to the eye. It looks cartoony as hell. It, it wasn't like shocking or anything in the slightest. And we get this nice moment between Axel and Sarah of I love you. It's convenient that your side piece, your pregnant side piece was murdered, so we don't have to worry about that in the post credits. At this point, Tom, who is very, very injured and is obviously bleeding, walks away, pulls off his mask, breaks the fourth wall by looking into the camera, and walks off for his sequel date. Now that we finally got through the movie, let's try to talk about some highlights. For me, one of the highlights was, well, an increased gore factor. One of the pluses of all of our technological advances is a lot more blood and splatter if we want it. Unfortunately, I don't think this movie really delivered what I wanted, but it had a concept there and I was hopeful for it. 
Uh, same thing with rearranging the story. I liked where it could have gone. I liked how we were mixing things up while still keeping a lot of the subject matter. But again, it didn't stick the landing for me, but I like the potential. I was a huge fan of the opening credits. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great way to get into the story. It had great music and maybe guess what was going on. But it's kind of the high there and it just mm, plateaued from there, unfortunately for me. Yeah, the movie just didn't deliver on the promise the credits gave us. Mm -hmm. Low lights about this movie. We've been very critical about it. However, one thing I will say is I was so sick of the 3D gimmicks. Ugh. I get that it was a 3D movie, but there were so many eye things. There were so many things going at the screen. Like, you know that things were specifically done for 3D. And if you don't watch it in a theater, it's not going to hold up very well. I was going to drill down on one low light. For me, it was gonna be the love triangle. I didn't care. I didn't care. I was Sarah in the first movie. I just don't care anymore. I just, it just made everything more irritable for me. I just didn't like it. Sorry. Best kill. I definitely have to go with uh, Tom Atkins yes. because that was a very gnarly kill. It made me feel a little bit for a character, which wasn't really happening at all in that movie. And it made me actually go, oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, I agree. Tom Atkins kill for sure, because I don't know what his character name was. He's Tom Atkins. And it was, yeah, the first kill that made me go, ooh, when I saw it and it felt earned. I didn't even mind the 3D. Like I said, if our 3D had worked, I probably would have liked it. So yeah, best kill for me too, for sure. And which movie was better? I don't think this was a hard choice for us to make in the slightest. No, not at all. I was surprised, actually, very pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed the original so much, so I want to add it to my own collection, so. It's definitely going to be one that I'm going to watch every Valentine's Day now as a tradition. Oh, for sure. As far as holiday horror movies come, you can't go wrong with the original My Bloody Valentine. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Double Feature. If there's a specific movie you'd like to see featured, definitely let us know in the comments below. Until next time, we'll be here in the basement of bad dreams. And we'll let the credits roll on our next double, double feature. feature. Oh! Chocolate! Ah! You ate one! Thanks, I was saving that for later. We're not sponsored by Dove. We're not sponsored at all. We're not sponsored. We're poor.